Hello, I'm talking to you today because this year in the EU we have the chance of getting rid of one of the most anachronistic, most un-European and most analog practices on the internet. Uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's this right here. Uh, it stops millions of Europeans from watching the videos they want to see, ordering goods online and downloading content and uh, even seeing things that they've paid for with their own taxes or that's funded by advertising. So everybody hates geoblocking, right? Um, not everybody. There is a small town in Belgium where some people at least uh, have a different view. This is from a debate in the European Parliament. An end to geoblocking would favour the bigger players and as we know most of these are from the other side of the Atlantic and are not so present on our continent. The idea of a pan-European alliance license, I think, would be uh, an impediment. We have to take account of the cultural diversity on our continent, uh, language, culture, etc. So it means that not all works will be able to have access to the same audiences. As an English speaker, I actually feel very strongly about this because the market is already overloaded with American products. And the last thing you know, I want as, as a British person, and I'm sure all of you as, as, as from other member states want, is actually more American programs in Europe. And if we, if we, if, if we do away with geo-blocking and we actually introduce something along the lines of a single European copyright, we will find that the big American players have more access to the market and we see more of them. We don't only want American films and concerns to be supported in Europe. We want to ensure that... Uh, our creative spirits are strengthened in Europe. So you have quite a lot of politicians from different parties who are somehow arguing geoblocking is actually protecting European cultures. Uh, I would like to challenge that notion today and point out a lot of the problems that we have with geoblocking. Uh, first of all, you have creators who could have a bigger audience in Europe but actually fail to reach this audience and people who would actually like to pay for content online and they find out that there is no way of legally paying for the films or the music that they would like to see. Uh, Geoblocking is particularly a huge problem for linguistic minorities. Uh, one in ten Europeans speaks some kind of a minority language and uh, these minorities and also long-term migrants quite often find themselves in the situation that they are permanently on the wrong side of the border and uh, they are too small of a group for the market to serve them. And uh, that means in practice that sometimes they are geo-blocked from even watching the news coverage of elections in which they would be allowed to vote in. So uh, they really are suffering from this practice. And when you think about it, geoblocking is also just about the most un-European thing you can think of. Uh, Europe is conceived to be one single market where people can communicate freely. Uh, any of you who may have uh, grown up in Western Germany and went uh, to school in the 80s or earlier, uh, you probably learned French in school or had the opportunity to learn French in school. Uh, there's a reason for that. For decades, European politicians have tried to make it easier for Europeans to communicate with each other. And it would be completely unthinkable, for example, for you to go into a store uh, in Italy during your holiday and to be uh, denied service because you have the wrong passport and uh, on the internet which is a global medium suddenly this practice is uh, still being used even though even putting into place these borders actually requires an active intervention from the companies so why are we uh, requiring companies to to keep using this practice um, what we can say and what the European Commission has actually found out in its own studies is that geoblocking is pretty much universally hated. Uh, from the consumers they asked about this, 80% said that they had come into contact with geoblocking in their own lives and even more, 90% said that geoblocking shouldn't happen within the European Union. So why does it happen? Um, first of all, in copyright law itself, there is nowhere where it says that uh, uh, companies that show something online have to geoblock it. However, if you buy a license for content, the rights holder can impose conditions on how you show them. And quite a lot of uh, particularly larger rights holders like Hollywood Studios are putting something in their contract to require geoblocking. So what you can see here um, is from the Sony leaks. These are internal uh, Sony documents 
uh, that were put on the internet a while ago and it says for example from a contract with Amazon that Amazon has to em uh, employ geoblocking and it even has to uh, block VPNs or proxies that people use to get around geoblocking. So this is something that quite often the company that geoblocks actually has no control over because it's a rights holder that's uh, imposing the geoblocking on them in a contract. Um, but there can also be other reasons for geoblocking that have nothing to do with uh, contracts between rights holders and uh, services and maybe they don't even have anything to do with copyright. Uh, quite a lot of people uh, think that the reason why live streams are often geoblocked in Germany some, somehow is a copyright problem. Uh, actually there is a different reason for this. Um, in Germany if you uh, provide a live stream uh, you have to see whether you comply with the so-called Rundfunkstaatsvertrag, which is a wonderful uh, broadcasting law that uh, doesn't exist in exactly the same way in other countries. And uh, the Rundfunkstaatsvertrag uh, tests whether what you provide online is actually a web TV service. So uh, you have to look at different criteria. First of all, is your live stream targeted at more than 500 people? Uh, second of all, is it somehow occurring regularly at uh, fixed intervals and does it have some kind of uh, journalistic or editorial content? Uh, if all of these are the case, you are actually a broadcaster and require a broadcasting license. So perhaps the live streams from Republika, since it has been taking place for 10 years, maybe the Republika is a broadcaster now. Uh, of course, any kind of company that is offering live stream services quite often doesn't want to have to test this and doesn't want to have to deal with the national laws uh, of German broadcasting and so quite often they decide to simply block live streams in Germany altogether. Uh, YouTube actually did this until uh, quite a, a short while ago and uh, the same problem also exists with other uh, um, live streaming services. So uh, there is certainly a problem that if every country in the EU kind of deals with, uh, with their laws that regard the internet somehow differently, you're going to have the problem that it will be too costly for companies to comply with all of these 28 different laws and sometimes they will decide to just block laws, uh, to block for certain countries instead. But uh, sometimes geoblocking is also a business decision to protect a particular outdated business model. Uh, one case of this is uh, actually a practice by the BBC. Uh, this is uh, Doctor Who, quite a, quite a popular BBC show uh, that actually people could watch uh, on Netflix quite shortly after the shows were produced. Except the last season of uh, Doctor Who was not available for Netflix users in Great Britain where the show was actually coming from because the BBC had decided they wanted to protect the DVD sales that would be higher uh, in the UK they thought if people have no possibility to watch the show on Netflix. So quite often it's just a question of making a little bit more profit by not showing certain things. Uh, of course, all of these different reasons for geoblocking can be combined with each other um, because uh, if you have, for example, the online service of a public broadcaster, they combine a lot of uh, different elements. They may have some, of, uh, some films that they have produced themselves, others for which they have bought a license, and uh, they are mixing all these different uh, things and some of them maybe have to be geoblocked and others don't. But uh, what happens quite often is that it's too difficult to make this decision based on every single piece of information that they're showing and instead they end up, for example, blocking a news report uh, about the Austrian elections that has absolutely no commercial value outside of Austria. But uh, the effect of this is, of course, that people who could vote in these elections are not able to follow the news on the Internet and nobody actually has any benefit from that because there is no uh, way that this content could somehow be used again at a later point and still be valuable. So what should the EU be doing about this? Um, there are some uh, ideas that are floating around that would actually be relatively easy to achieve. First of all, uh, what you could do is allow something that's called passive sales. This is a, a concept that already exists for physical products and it means that if you are a streaming company, you have to buy a, or get a license for showing a film in the country in which you operate. And then if you uh, 
show this on the internet, you don't have to check where your users are coming from. The only thing that you have to make sure is that you don't actively advertise your program in a different country. So for example, if I'm showing the, the Champions League, I've bought a license for that in Germany, I can show it, but I don't go around uh, putting advertisement for that into Irish television or something like that. And uh, I think this concept is pretty familiar already that uh, people comply with the law of the country in which they are based. So, so for example, uh, if I uh, go shopping during my holiday in Italy and I go into a shop there, they do sell me a product, but they don't have to comply with German consumer protection law. So we're basically making it easy for both sides and this could be applied uh, to the internet and online videos as well. Um, the second thing is uh, to enforce anti-discrimination law. This is uh, Margrethe Vestager, the commissioner for uh, competition in the European Commission because uh, it may turn out that quite a lot of the contracts that Hollywood studios have made, for example, with pay TV uh, providers such as Sky, are already illegal. Um, the Commission is investigating whether these geo-blocking uh, agreements, as uh, the one that you have seen with Sony, are actually in conflict with EU competition law. Um, it's already the case that um, a member state, for example, is not allowed to keep a company from selling to people in a particular country. So now the question is, is a company allowed to keep another company from selling to customers in another country? And the Commission is looking into this right now. Um, another thing that uh, uh, the EU is actually working on is uh, to uh, allow you to take your Netflix subscription on holiday, so a kind of roaming for uh, online subscriptions of pay TV, of uh, streaming services and so on. Uh, but it's really important that uh, we don't screw this up because there are already um, some lobbyists from the film industry who are saying, okay, this portability, you know, allowing somebody who has already paid for a, a subscription in their home country, it's okay that they take it abroad and use it during their holiday, but only for two weeks. After that, it has to stop. Uh, this, of course, would create a lot of problems uh, uh, from a privacy point of view if suddenly we are forcing all the streaming services to track everywhere you are going from where you are accessing the Internet just so they can switch off your access after 14 days. Uh, that would be a terrible scenario and completely disproportionate. So um, there is definitely a chance that by trying to take these really small approaches to geoblocking, we may actually be making some things worse. So um, they, we do see that uh, the, the European Commission seems to have the right intentions in the sense that they're doing something about geoblocking, but there is a danger if we don't get involved that actually uh, these proposals will not address the, the core of the problem that is online video simply not being available in your country. Uh, and that uh, the things that they do fix, such as taking your videos on holiday with you, could actually raise more new problems, uh, for example, for data protection. So on 25th of May, the European Commission is going to present some new proposals uh, that will uh, probably only address uh, geo-blocking of products. So for example, if you get a different price for a car rental, if you order the same car from Austria than from Germany. And of course, uh, they should do something about that, but uh, especially the proposals that would end geo-blocking for online video, which is really what most of us are annoyed about, uh, these proposals have been postponed to September, and there is a real danger that uh, if we don't say that we actually want this, uh, there will be other people whose voices will be heard and uh, nothing may come out of this reform after all. So uh, what are these voices? Um, this is something that you see quite a lot. So here we have an article from The Hollywood Reporter who is saying that uh, if the EU gets rid of geo-blocking, this will destroy independent film in Europe completely. Uh, it's quite an Orwellian argument in a way. Geo-blocking protects uh, films. So basically by not being seen, these films uh, will somehow be more successful. Um, and I think uh, uh, it's quite remarkable that they're basically saying we're out looking out for the little guy for the European independent films and this is coming from the Hollywood Reporter, especially taken into account that it's also Hollywood studios that are uh, actually being investigated by the European Commission uh, for their, uh, their geo-blocking practices. So I don't think uh, if something were really uh, a measure to protect 
European small independent uh, um, film producers, why are there so many Hollywood uh, studios out there doing exactly the same thing? Um, and there is finally also the argument that, uh, oh, we shouldn't complain so much about geo-blocking anyway because it's just, uh, we should just get used to it and it's the same thing as in uh, the offline world. Uh, here's an example of that. Ich vergleiche das mal auch mit anderen Sektoren, die jetzt nicht äh, im Bereich des Intellectual Property Rights ist. Ich kann in Deutschland in keinem Supermarkt, in keiner Bäckerei ein finnisches Brot kaufen. Warum? Äh, das würden bei uns viel zu wenige kaufen, deshalb bietet der Markt mir das nicht an. Gehe ich hin und fordere jetzt von der Europäischen Kommission, dass ich dieses Produkt bitte schön gefälligst in meinem Supermarkt so uh, the, the core here of this argument is basically uh, the market will solve it and if, there is, uh, if something is not offered in your country, well, maybe there's just no demand for it. But, well, imagine being part of the Danish minority in Germany. You're just a few thousand people. There was never going to be a market to buy a license to show a Danish original language film in Germany. Uh, because there are just not enough people who are going to buy it. But of course, if you don't geoblock the film, nobody is going to be hurt by this either because it will only be the Danish-speaking people who can actually see it uh, and uh, there wouldn't actually be any loss for anybody. So there, these are kind of the core arguments that come up again and again. First of all, that only large US players would benefit if we get rid of geo-blocking. Well, uh, first of all, if you look at the European market for video on demand today, uh, you already have only US players that actually serve the entire European market. There is not a single European video on demand platform that is available in all 28 member states. And one reason for that is that it's extremely complex to actually get all the licenses for the 28 uh, markets and uh, perhaps Netflix can handle such a complexity simply because of their scale and because they already have a single market of 500 million potential customers in the US. But we need to make it easier to provide such services in all of Europe also for European startups. Uh, today, if you look at the UK, for example, only 5% of the video on demand uh, m services that are available in the UK actually come from another EU country. So uh, in the current situation, basically, you have very, very few online services that operate in the entire EU, and then you have a lot of national services that only target a particular market. Um, I don't think that in a situation where U.S. companies are the only ones who can actually offer a European service, uh, that somehow getting rid of geo-blocking would create that very situation that we already have. Um, another one uh, I've already uh, hinted at somewhat is that geo-blocking protects cultural diversity. Uh, I was very surprised when I heard this argument for the first time because it's completely counterintuitive. It's kind of, uh, uh, yeah, saying that if we, if we uh, keep people from watching European films, they will somehow get more interested in it. And uh, I think a good thing, if you want to protect uh, cultural minorities and cultural diversity, ask the cultural minorities what they think about it. And uh, if you talk to, for example, the European language equality networks, exactly the people, the lobbyists of the cultural minorities, they will tell you that geoblocking is a huge problem for them and that it actually harms cultural diversity. And um, if you have a, a Hollywood company that can actually maximize its profits by selling an exclusive license to a film that everybody wants to see uh, 28 times to different distributors in each of the 28 countries, of course they may be able to make more money out of that uh, than if the films weren't geoblocked. But on the other hand, if you're a, a smaller European production that isn't in English, there's actually a good chance that people will still buy a license for this film simply to show it in a dubbed version, to show it in a subtitled version, and to make it accessible to the local market. So the cultural diversity, I think, can really be a benefit for the European uh, film because uh, it will be perfectly possible to segment the market this way. Um, Finally, uh, the film producers particularly say that the film financing depends on geoblocking, the way that it is organized today. So they say if they go to a bank and get a, a loan to produce a film, um, they need a promise from a distributor that they will actually distribute it, uh, show it in the cinemas and so on. And the distributors will only give that promise if they are awarded ex complete territorial exclusivity. Um, 
the funny thing about this is that uh, this exclusivity never or very, very rarely actually has a relevance in practice. Because even if you look at the most popular films in Europe and whether they are available uh, on video on demand platforms, you will find even really the popular award winning European films will not be available on any video on demand platform at all in most European countries. So you have a big potential audience that would like to pay to see certain movies and there simply is no offer because uh, the, uh, the territorial licenses have to be exclusive, Nobody, nothing else is there at the moment, but of course if you took away this absolute territorial exclusivity and told all the players, okay, you don't have to geoblock your content, but of course you can adapt it to your local market, you can only show it in a certain language, and the vast majority of other Europeans will simply not be able to understand this. I think the, the system would work perfectly fine. I don't think that suddenly uh, a lot of Germans will start watching uh, uh, Estonian video on demand service that shows films in Estonian just because they can save a few bucks. I mean, uh, maybe it's a bit different in this audience, but the vast majority of Germans greatly prefer a dubbed German version of a film and they're willing to pay for that uh, uh, over an original version that they may not even understand very well. Um, finally, one point I think that is really important to point out is that uh, about half of the financing for EU independent film is actually direct public funding. And on top of that you get tax breaks and so on. So the taxpayer has already paid quite a lot for these independent European films to be produced in the first place. And I think it would be in the public interest that the viewers who have paid for these films actually have a chance to watch them. So um, the European Commission is now uh, planning to lay out these detailed plans, first of all on products, on the 25th of May. After this, you will have around one year to get involved, to uh, talk to your public representatives, to talk about the issue of geoblocking publicly. And I think it's important that uh, you show uh, the public representatives that geoblocking is actually something that annoys people in their daily lives. Because if you listen to some of the discussions in the European Parliament, you sometimes get the feeling that uh, the voices of those who say geoblocking is important and is there to uh, support some, some important European values, that these voices are a lot louder than simply of the people who are faced with geoblocking on a daily basis. So please join me in pushing for the end of geoblocking and make sure that you get in contact with your representatives about this. Um, I am launching a campaign called uh, ngeoblocking.eu and it will go online before the Commission announcement on the 25th of May. Uh, already there are videos on the website that you can share and check out um, and sign up on the website to be notified about the further steps of the campaign. Uh, we've also brought some stickers uh, to ngeoblocking. They look like this, and uh, Justo sitting up here has a whole bag of them if you want to pick some up later. Um, now, there's one more thing. Tomorrow uh, at 5.30, there is a lightning talk that I would really uh, like to encourage you to check out. It's done by Copyright for Creativity, uh, which is uh, an association of all kinds of uh, actors, including artists, rights holders, users, researchers, who all want copyright to be reformed. And uh, they will launch a new campaign for the ongoing copyright reform that goes beyond just the issue of geoblocking. Uh, I've talked about geoblocking today, but uh, there are lots of uh, issues with copyright that need to be changed. And uh, two at the moment are particularly important. One is to make sure that people in all of Europe can use pictures of public buildings uh, that they make, that's the so-called freedom of panorama. The other one is to keep the European Commission from introducing an ancillary copyright for press publishers. Uh, this is something that we've already had in Germany and in Spain for many years. It's also known as the Google tax. Uh, so basically, if a search engine uses a small part from a newspaper article, uh, they have to pay for that. There are lots of problems with these laws already, and they're creating a lot of issues, for example, for smaller publishers and startups in Germany. So please check out uh, the lightning talk uh, at 5.30 tomorrow by Copyright for Creativity. And uh, uh, me and my... Uh, 
uh, assistants Justus and Christopher will also be around if you want to answer to the public consultation that the Commission is currently doing on these two questions. Uh, you can also ask us and we can help you, guide you uh, through this consultation. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much uh, for listening and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Perfect. Thank you.